just coming from a little place like Ardoin and then you come to something like this that you've never seen before. It's just a dream. And to actually get an apprenticeship at a club like Leeds United, it was brilliant. Miss it. Ardoin was home, and to this day is still home. You know, it's still always referred to it as home. But I feel very comfortable here. It was an escape from that hostility that was we experienced as kids in, in Ardoin. In a sense, it has contributed a great deal to the way I am today. Some people may have left Ardoin and have never looked back. But for me, it's still something that is core to who I am. Holy Cross Ardoin is a Catholic parish in North Belfast, which is bordered by Protestant areas. Both sides of the community here have seen more suffering than most throughout the Troubles. Growing up in that context gave me the drive to try and make a difference. That's why I have chosen to work here, particularly with young people in the community. Whenever people hear about Ardoin, they have a very one-dimensional stereotype, you know, that Ardoin is a Republican stronghold. I think there is a deeper and a much richer story to be told about this community, and that's reflected very much in the lives of the altar boys that I grew up with. These were boys who grew up together to be men who grew apart. The summer of 1969 changed our lives forever. Some chose opposite sides in the conflict some left and never looked back. Many of them went on to be very successful in their lives. For the first time in nearly 50 years, I want to track them down and bring them back together in Ardoin. I was aware of the fact that there was a cachet about being from Ardoin. It's a place apart. I wonder what it would have been like to grow up in a normal place. In a sense, I regret that I didn't get that. When you consider we were dealing with life and death on a daily basis, I mean, that's not the average experience of an 11 and 12 year old growing up. Living in Ardoin during the darkest days of the Troubles, people began to develop an island's mentality. There's a sense of here is something that all of us had in common at one stage. But from that common experience, people decided that they would go off in different paths. That's led them into many different areas throughout the world. Hello, Jared. Jared is Brian McKee here from Up the Holy Cross. Hello. I tell you what it is, we've talked about the reunion of some of the fellows who were altar boys during the 60s. Is there any way that you know that we might be able to get in touch with them? Sure, but you're, you're open to the idea. You're the next one. I suppose my worries is that some people may choose not to take part, and that may be because of something in their personal story. It may be because of something within someone else's story who's coming together. In the same garden, there's so many different flowers. You know, and that's really what life's like, you know. We're not all going to be roses. You know, you got a few jaggy nettles. When I was in the, the church here as an altar boy, it was all pure innocence. I still cherish the good memories and the happy days, and the days of total joy. My father was a bricklayer and my mother was just a genius at everything. They were both active Republicans. People may find this news, I say every member of my family had been in a prison. It was one of the, the sad facts that you are a product of your environment and the environment we had here was such that if you didn't swim, you'd sink. I remember being over on the Falls Road 
the RUC had come out and as they were coming down the street they were beating their, their riot shields with their batons and the RUC man spotted me carrying in a doorway. I was dragged out of the doorway and the RUC man started slaughtering me. The bruises and all the thumps all healed but that man and his language left a, a lasting scar. I would say I was involved in the Republican struggle, and I'd leave it at that. We all started off from a point of mutual understanding, which was we were altar boys. And yet we all took several different paths. I remember telling my mother and father I was contemplating joining the police. We just said, well, it's the lesser of two evils. He then came out and said then, well, it is better to be buried by the state than to be buried by the IRA. To come from where I am, to be a Catholic, joining the RUC, I knew once in it, there probably was no turning back. My life dramatically changed where I was a civilian, 18 years of age, playing a bit of hurling, becoming a sworn officer with powers. I mean, I just wonder, did anybody wonder where I went? Or did they know where I went? Or did they care where I went? How far did he get on it? What was his rank? I am the head of the Close Protection Branch Superintendent responsible for the protection of the Royal Family while visiting Northern Ireland. I'm the longest serving Catholic police officer. Oh, I was an act of treachery. I'll just let it mellow around in my head for a while. We're not just products of the past, but the past has made us what we are. As altar boys, we shared the same experiences growing up and had a common bond. But the events that were to come would change everything. These were people who made decisions at a particular point in time. And that's part and parcel of the whole story of our life. You know, different paths, different people, different choices. There we go. <laughs> well, good. That's a start anyway. Here we go. <laughs> Four fish and three hooks, not bad. Whoa! Oh, look at that. Oh, look. A ras. All I can say is thanks be to God, they're very stupid fish. <laughs> Life is complicated. You know, people report in Belfast, they report in Ardoin, it's all very simple. You know, bigots and terrorists and labels all over the place. It's not like that. It's human beings caught up in situations. First memories are, are done strange, but very aware, of course, when you looked out the window in the front of the house, what did you see? The church, Holy Cross Ardoin, that was it. It kind of then became the dominant symbol in my life. A lot of my friends would have been altar boys, and Cal, of course, was an altar boy too, leading the way, my older brother. What I remember about it was a sense of camaraderie, fellowship, I don't recall ever being even remotely aware of anything improper in the attitude of priests to me or to anyone else that I knew of. We used to have unspoken competitions to see who could ring the bells the loudest. One judged one's peers by the ferocity with which you banged the bells. I might be imagining this, but I think I was good at it. <laughs> Cahill was a big messer. You know, you'd never have thought that he would have achieved so much. I would say about all the elder boys, there was no angels among them. They might have been good elder boys, but I don't think there were, there were angels. It was like a boys club. Although we were in the monastery, we never talked about religion. You know, we talked about football. As I was growing up, then talked about girls. I do remember Sean at one stage had a little 
gang, as it were. You had to have a password to get in. And I could never keep remembering it, so I didn't last very long. <laughs> we were all brought down one Sunday, showing this room, which got called Australia, because it was underground. Uh, but there it was, a table tennis table. Who had seen such a thing? <laughs> And it was for the older boys. He always fancied himself as a bit of a table tennis player. So it'll be interesting to see just how much, how far he went along their career path. One of the great perks of the elder boys was that when you were on an early mass in the morning, Brother Pascal made a large jug of lovely coffee. And obviously he put the sugar into it and he put the milk. But even now, when I talk, I can actually taste the coffee. It was just amazing. I've never tasted the coffee like it since. I think joining the altar was, it was a good thing, because when you were there, you know, there was somebody to talk to, to have a bit of crack with and stuff like that. The altar boys were a very close-knit set of friends. And that's probably the strength of being an altar boy, was that you were part of something that was much bigger than yourself. It was an important role that you were playing. And these other people were your partners. Little did we realise that that wonderful innocence of childhood was about to be taken away from us. Here we have the altar list for the 17th of August, 1969 which was the weekend when, I suppose, mayhem broke out in the streets of Ardoin. Sectarian rioting marked the beginning of a decades-long conflict that shaped the rest of our lives. It was a strange feeling when you were growing up watching the whole thing unfold in front of you. Part of it you were scared, but also the excitement of it. Ten years of age, it's almost as if, you know, Indiana Jones comes to Ardoin. And it seemed to us that there was a riot outside the house for two or three years, non-stop. We closed the shutters in case the windows were broken, and those shutters were never opened again. There was no daylight in that room ever again. Fear, absolute fear. I was terrified. You could see through the skylight of my bedroom, the flames were leaping high. The houses were being burnt. And I was just terrified, shaking in the bed, just wanting this to be over. think that the revolution was coming and, you know, prepare for the revolution. The situation wasn't in my control or really in any young person's control. Fellas of the same age as me ended up behind bars, sometimes for doing nothing and sometimes for doing perfectly awful things. It could have been me. I did join the local branch of the Fianna. I think the local priest had seen me, so I was confronted by my father and I left. So my career as a freedom fighter was very, very short. You can't ignore it when it's coming into your own home, when it's, when it's your family. I was interned on two occasions. It was another level of education for me. And I got a degree out of Long Case, the University of Freedom. We were right there wrong. I could never see it in those terms. It was never that clear. Because, I mean, the IRA, what they were up to, I couldn't relate to. I couldn't relate to it. Innocent people were being killed. 
I suppose I began to take refuge in the church, in the madness that was a safe place. Maybe in and around that time, the whole vocation thing was, was at work. I had to escape. Yeah. I was ordained in 1984, and then the next day, my first Mass in Ardoyne. Very emotional time. Are we altar boys a priest now, you know? I was going to go to Rome, live in Rome for three years. I mean, that was just... It doesn't get any better. My daddy said, a barman from Belfast, look at me, and look at us, and here we are, we've just had Mass with the Pope. Absolutely beside themselves. There's always a sense for people, you know, that our down kind of punched above its weight. You know, that despite everything that went on there, you, you know, that pe our down people still managed to rise above it. All I can say with any certainty is that I was fortunate to meet certain people at certain times. I didn't get arrested, I didn't get shot, I wasn't blown up. I got a good education. I was in the right place at the right time when the job of Director General of RT became advertised. For whatever reason, I was given the job and stayed in it for seven years. This friend of mine rang me up after apparently my picture was in the front of the Irish News and he said, that it was the first time somebody from Ardoin was on the front of the Irish News who wasn't the accused or the deceased. So that, that's kind of playing into the stereotype of hard men and all that from Ardoin. We were in difficult times, it was difficult circumstances, but we were trying and we got a home fit for heroes. When Sinn Féin put itself into election gear, Everybody started to sit back and notice. I'm proud enough to say I was elected in that first wave of fresh new faces going into Belfast City Council. I think it's a lot of people have recognised that Sinn Féin are appealing to, uh, across the nationalist divide. Part of my daily work was in the North American desk in Sinn Féin. I had the pleasure of accompanying Jerry Adams after the 94 ceasefire had been called. And for whatever small part I played on it, I feel immensely proud. You know, unlike many of them during you know, the decision to stay in Ardoin, a lot of people decided to get out quick, and other people decided to get out to go for a better lifestyle. Sean, how are you doing? This has taken about six weeks to track you down. The last time I saw you, is way back in the early 70s and you were this athletic looking young man with black combed hair with brill cream with a suit and a shirt and a tie on which is quite unusual in our down. I was playing football sort of every spare minute you've got I was always determined that one way or another I was going to get a living out of it. Look at that, isn't that brilliant? Hey, it's big, isn't it? Holly Grump used to play football here. That's where we used to come out, because that was the changing rooms over there. And then we used to come out onto the football pitch to play. Why? Why? Because that's how Grump Grump, Grump Grump got paid to play football. And it was really good. Just to play with so, so many great players, it just you come off and I was on a high for like two or three days afterwards. It's just, it's just brilliant. Everybody took a certain pride and it was one of our boys, you know, we lot from Ardoin, going over to play for one of the biggest teams in the world. I know, you can head the ball, watch, head the ball. Are you heading the ball? <laughs> you silly devil. I know, ball! I think family's everything, isn't it, you know? Are you having a beef burger? Yeah. Good Lord, Ollie. I came in June and my father died in the November. He never saw me playing. I think it really toughens you up. There's not much worse going to happen in your life. He's still there. He's, he's still part of you. And it's... It doesn't go away. boy will always want to some way identify with his father and yet will always fight with his father. 
what we do. What I had in common with Daddy was religion. I wanted to please him. Why did you leave the priesthood? In my case, it was because I had to grow up. That wasn't the right choice. Staying Mass for the last time, I had arrived at peace about this. And Daddy just, he couldn't believe it. He just couldn't believe it. And he, he didn't really cope too well at all with it. The night that he died, we got into the emergency room. I approached him right up into his ear. And I told him, I, I'm here, Dad, and I'm going to give you absolution. Which, of course, is the role of a priest. My brother said to me, he opened his eyes, you know, when you spoke to him. <laughs> the relationship had been fractured over the whole priesthood thing. Somehow then the priesthood thing kind of mended it at the end. Hello, would that be Brendan? Yes, yeah, yes, how are you? Brendan, it's Brian here, how are you doing? Great to hear you. Good. I think he's one of the guys who when he left he didn't come back and seems to be someone who's very much at the top of the tree in his own profession. Brendan trained as both a dentist and a doctor in Belfast before emigrating to America. I'm an assistant clinical professor. My main interest is in trauma. People that have been in car accidents or the victims of trauma that they face, I would be involved in their reconstruction. I can do a triage for you. Okay. Um, oh, he's right. Three mandibular teeth. Tell me about the patient. Um, he's healthy for the most part except for psychiatric medications. Part of my job okay. demands that I do have to have a resilience. Those early days in our dying were very formative in developing that. How old is he? 46. Wow. Yeah, so actually in Belfast I saw some horrendous things. Yeah. I remember being in the Royal Victoria one night. A police officer came in and a, a mortar bomb had exploded over his head. And I remember lifting the tea towel and there was uh, chunks of his brain sticking to the tea towel. You know? So you don't forget that. There you go. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Good job. It's going to be a celebration of all the altar boys. How do you feel about going back to Belfast and then meeting the altar boy? It's going to be excellent because I haven't seen the, you know, any of these people that I served mass with in 40 years, you know, so it's going, to be, it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it because we've all gone in very, very different directions. themselves. It'd be interesting to meet these guys and to see is there something that we identify as a shared trait? Are we all thick bastards or is there something far more meaningful behind it all? I haven't been in the Ardoin since I joined the police. I have no idea how I will feel. I hope he can sleep easy with himself. It doesn't come back and cause him any sleepless nights. I fear it might. I try not to judge him too harshly. Are they still the same bells? They are. Yes. Can I? <laughs> he was never any good at ringing the bells. <laughs> How are you? Great. And you haven't changed a bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How are good you? You're you. looking well. I have this memory of you uh, playing football up in the playing field on yeah. Valley Sound. I'm glad somebody's got a memory. Oh. I, <laughs> I can't remember you. Are you adjourned? You're very welcome. Thank you very You're very much. welcome. Do you know any of these bandits? Cal, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, how are you doing? Jared. Been 
perhaps been your nemesis in terms going oh, back. <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. Well, I'm now chairperson of the PSNI Gilly Club. The dirtiest team in the league, the PSNI. <laughs> more, right. su more suspense. But it's the only time you get else. a chance to kick a peeler. So it's of benefit. Oh. What's this assertion that I was late all the time? <laughs> I want to see this. You were. The nearest one to the church, and he's late. Oh, well, obviously, my mother used to say that. <laughs> The nearest to church, the further from God. <laughs> Your mother was See, very well. It wasn't <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, there's a resemblance, you know, when you were a child. You know, when I walked in there, yeah. I said, I know this person. But you have a few hours free tomorrow afternoon, like, do we better? <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't. It's not much easier. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want me to do your dentistry. I, I, I had to do surgery because I was a lousy dentist, you see, so that was it. So that's... <laughs> it's, it's strange that we all started off here as ultra boys and then we all grow past. I ended up in the special patrol group in Tennant Street. That, those not, my, the... not my favourite people there. No, 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 but I, I, I always thought of myself as one of the good guys. Often there is a need for reconciliation within communities. There needs to be the acknowledgement and the acceptance that people did choose different paths. Did you not recognise that there was violence coming from the RUC? I found it so remarkable to hear that there was an altar boy who had served at the altar in Ardoin who had went on to join it. I will be the first to hold my hand up and say the RUC wasn't Lily White, but there were a lot of good and honourable men and women in the RUC. Maybe I was naive, but I, I honestly believe that I was doing something good. If you were inside that police organisation and you were looking out, in some of the things we were doing, we actually thought, well, actually, we're doing it right. It's amazing there that I'm, I'm sitting here with you. To disagree over... And, and, yeah, to disagree and, and to be able to walk away without yeah. violence. Yes. But by God, what a path you have come upon and what a path I, I have come upon. Tonight is a very special night because we celebrate this Mass for the reunion of our altar servers and boys, well, traditionally. 42 years after joining the police, coming through the most horrendous violence in Northern Ireland, I am one that just or so so grateful and actually thank God that I'm alive. I think you just gotta, as Granny says to their own self, be true. No matter what you do, you've got to be lucky. If you get a little bit of luck, take everything that comes your way and enjoy it. Not everything has been perfect, but it's been true, it's been life. Something that was really good about being in a place with such a strong sense of parish and belonging. And even after the troubles broke out, you had this bond with people. There is that kind of sense, you can't get away from where you come from. And it's always going to be part and parcel of who you are. I'm from Ardoin. That's all right. That means something. You know, they know how to look after themselves and are doing. <laughs>